in studio to continue sharing his thoughts on this. We have Sheikh Ihsan Talib. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hajjah Khadija. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. And shukran for the open invitation. Always, always, always. <laughs> and, and particularly when it comes to these topics, when, when we speak about, um, uh, and, and last week we started unpacking some of these, you know, the, 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 uh, these concepts. Uh, yeah. Sheikh explained to us how important it is that we understand uh, what we mean, the, 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 these, 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 um, that, that they don't just remain in the realm of the theoretical, that religious pluralism is something, it exists, we live with it, but we also need to understand what it's not. You did explain to us that of course language has its restrictions um, and referring to Quran and what what it means when we speak about the plurality but of course there are certain things when the some key themes that that that, that come across the fact that um, there's always even when we speak about plurality the idea that that uh, uh, in the Quran uh, Christians and Jews are referred to as people as the book of the people of the book and mm. we recognize shared belief so of course that takes us back to the universal um, uh, to universal values when we speak about justice when we speak about compassion when we speak about human dignity mm. and so when we speak about peaceful coexistence uh, that the Quran encourages us to, to, to for Muslims to live like this it's never at the cost of course of 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 those uh, values we also spoke about the fact that um that these common grounds and 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 we refer to how often within a liberal narrative a hegemonic narrative that differences are often emphasized um mm. and so this idea and so, so so we alluded to islamophobic to islamophobia etc because there's this idea around what islam is uh, uh backward and of course um misogynistic violent etc so we don't we don't look to we look to the common ground and of course hearkening again back to the ethical values and the human rights that's Im- well the, that's embedded in the in Quran um and and so when we speak about relativism with religious relativism we're also clear about the fact that religion is not subjective anybody mm. cannot just walk in mm. and and interpret it's also not exclusionary but it's also not about it being a salvation mm. um uh, mm. as uh, as such um I, I as a last point that I, I want to make is 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 what is what Sheikh pointed us uh, towards this idea that the 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 primary or integral to to when it comes to re- religion is the vertical relationship the relationship between mm-hmm. the human and god mm-hmm. the human being and god but there's also the horizontal so 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 the fact that we are interrelational beings so there is the vertical there's a horizontal and then that takes us into into tawhid being a civilizational impulse mm-hmm. Because now we're dealing with humankind and humanity and then our duties and obligations towards humanity. Um, so, Sheikh, please, without any further ado, please do continue. Sure. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive and accurate um, recap of, of our conversation of, of last while, the last time. I make dua that... Uh, my students can be as a dent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I told you already, Sheikh, it's so difficult to, to summarize because I have all these notes and there's so much. I, I believe that we can, yeah, that we can take away from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you, you, I want to just perhaps hone in on, uh, again, the point of definitions. And this is, of course, very, very critical always. Um, And we as Muslims, we obviously sit with a a holy book, uh, you know, which is a book of of liberation. It emancipates the mind, you know. This book calls us, and again, I want to ask our listeners very kindly, you know, to pick up a, a... accurate and, um, um, you know, authoritative translations of the Holy Quran and study what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and what we are reading. Study it and and make sense of what you're reading. This intellect and this aql which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, gifted and which is part of what we will be talking about today, the notion of uh, of the criteria of, of the dignity of the human being compared to any of other uh, of the other of Allah's creation is precisely this aql is precisely the intellect, you know, that sets him apart and that um, distinguishes uh, humankind and human beings. And so we need to develop it. We need to, but the best source for the development and the empowerment of the intellect is the Quran, is the words of Allah, 
is Allah's, um, you know, um, processes of, of really liberating and causing, setting us on a path of emancipating the mind, right? So, uh, yes, there are complexities. There are uh, layers of meanings. There are nuances. Mm. The Quran in itself, in this way, uh, militates against literalism. You know, just understanding in a framework of black and white. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that you have to understand that Allah's creation of this entire universe, including humankind, especially perhaps humankind, is one which is always, um, you know, colored in shades of gray. And that there's levels and layers of complexity. And that we have to obviously um, be cognizant, but also appreciate and understand and then take ourselves to next levels of, like you said, if we're talking about the civilizational impulse, next levels of complex um, uh, 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 decisions and resolutions of, of problems. Uh, if we are going to be uh, one dimensional in our mm, thinking, mm. there's no way that we can bring about um, appropriate solutions to complex problems. And so the Quran is a, um, a, a, a absolute, um, you know, uh, a guide and a, and a manual for the development and training of such uh, skills, such civilizational uh, requirements. And so, yes, uh, we have clearly spoken about um, this ethical sort of, um, you know, framework that we're talking about a normative religious pluralism. And so here we're talking about the ethical conduct. Uh, that the Quran insists upon uh, in how we deal with our fellow human beings despite the fact that we are not uh, sharing the exact same theological uh, principles. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are common grounds like Allah says in the Holy Quran to the Prophet wasallam when he then uh, received, you know, the delegations of Christian um, uh, 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 sort of representatives. Christian delegations from different parts, even of the Arabian Peninsula, then he would say unto them, uh, Allah would say unto him to say to them, Qul ya ahl al kitab, say unto them, O people of the book, Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. Come, let us come together on a on common grounds. Yeah. Let us come together on the common grounds. Does that mean that the entirety of the Quran, which which speaks about the Tawheed of Allah, which emphasizes the uh, the the prophethood and the fact that the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Allah's final messenger uh, in the series of messengers throughout history, it doesn't flatten that. It requires of us to understand that despite the fact that you do not share the same beliefs. There is no justification, nor is there any virtue. In fact, it is frowned upon that you think you can um, conduct yourself in ways which um, imputes indignity to the next person, which imputes the other person with disrespect, which um, uh, does not uh, you know, extend to the other person the rights that you um, take for granted or uh, that you claim for yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, so the Quran obviously rejects that because that would be a lack of integrity of the highest order, <laughs> and it would be exclusionary. It'd be exclusionary. It'll it'll be uh, it'd be lacking ethics, and so this is the other thing about you know religion and ethics um, is that uh, you know in the normal course of events uh, people want to separate ethics from religion, mm. and. In Islam, there is no such thing. There is no such thing because if, yes, religion is about dogma. Yes, religion is about uh, cosmological truth and all of those kinds of things, which comes to humankind via revelation and how to conduct yourself in the, uh, you know, exemplary ways and and so forth and so forth. And yes, on the other hand, supposedly ethics are principles which are based on, you know, fairness and justice, mm. uh, fairness and um, uh, uh, respect and justice. 
and um, you know those values of 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 equity etc but in islam there is no distinction between the mm. two <laughs> the two harmoniously integrate not coexist not harmoniously coexist they are harmoniously integrated and so there is a coherence uh in the deen of islam as we have also made the reference last week about distinguishing between religion and what the quran emphasizes um it's a reference or the 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 phraseology that is used in the quran when it references islam as a deen and so the word deen is is really uh, been unjustly translated as a religion you understand and so i think all of those things uh, together the khadija is just to bring home the fact that yes there are always going to be layers of understanding and so it requires maturity of thinking mm. it requires maturity of the intellect of the believer because uh, the believer's uh, uh, reference point is revelation and revelation is all about is all about layers of complexity and meaning Yes, the foundational values are crystal clear, absolutely black and white, and that is there is no god but God. <laughs> That's black and white. Uh, those are the usul of the deen. So there is no, there are no uh, sort of layers of complexities about that. That is equally um, accessible to the most sophisticated of minds as it is accessible to perhaps the most undeveloped of minds. There is no god. but god la ilaha illallah and muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that allah has sent messengers throughout um uh, uh, throughout history throughout the ages and this is a logical thing this is a, a a reasonably understandable thing that allah god almighty sent humankind guidance sent a guide from among themselves to convey unto them um the truth and to remind them about the truth and so forth and so forth so those things are all uh, part of course of the deen and the deen's vision as we have said is about establishing uh, a just islamic civilization a just civilization and again the other day when we were in a conference we were talking about uh, terminologies and even uh, descriptors such as the word islamic you know so when uh, we're talking about the palestinian question for example would we uh, see a future where in uh, the request or the yearning would be for an islamic state for example <laughs> and the the problem with that is that in today's world if you're going to use a terminology like that you're going to draw the um ire and and the the fear of virtually and that is just how let alone non-muslim people even muslim people right so in islam there are there are absolute sort of you know guidelines about this you you, you there's you don't fret about terminologies it's about the essence of something that you yeah. fret about you you focus on the essence of something and you don't now um against you know all wisdom and against all reason insist on using a terminology uh when you should be insisting about getting the content of that terminology exactly looking at the content of it and so islam as a civilization like we've emphasized all the time is about justice is about mercy and compassion is about wisdom and is about the common good of all human kind is about the, that which is in the best interest of all human beings mm-hmm. and that is of course it's Islam, islam's foundational values which is based on you know the uh, philosophy of tawhid and belief in allah which drives uh, all forms uh, of development and so today in khadija our conversation is going further in terms of these ethical foundation of this normative pluralism in the quran and so of the points that we are looking at today was that we are going to be looking first and foremost how in the quran there is a focus on freedom of belief right and then we are going to look at how there is a focus on human dignity human dignity right and also we're going to look at integrity okay. and then we're going to look at allah's very specific um injunctions and uh proscriptions of um 
uh, against reviling that which others hold sacred. Re, uh, it's a, Allah's emphasis of prohibiting to revile things which others hold sacred. Mm. Even if those things are worshipped by them and it's uh, a, somehow tantamount to idolatry or whatever. Um, and also how the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with that when, for example, um, they made tawaf around the Kaaba during the time of Mecca <coughs> until the conquest of Medina, until Islam became firmly established and all the tribes rushed to embrace Islam. Until that point, 360 idols were mm. established right around the Kaaba and that was when everybody made tawaf around those idols who did not believe in the idols. Oh. So those who believed in the idols and those, of course, who believed in Allah alone, all of them together made the wealth around the idols. So if that's not a level of complexity that we have to wrap our heads around, then what can be? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, so we want to get right into um, when we speak about plurality, when we speak about religious pluralism and the various aspects um, uh, and components that you've broken it down into. The first one being freedom of belief. But then, of course, we speak about what is freedom. Yeah. Our understanding of freedom is very much rooted within, again, a hegemonic liberal narrative. When you speak about freedom, what do we mean? And we speak about freedom of faith. What do we understand? Absolutely. So, in Khadija, we want to now go into the Quran's uh, treatment of the concept of hurriya, you know, freedom, so to speak. This, this freedom, we have the term in, in Arabic, hurriya, and its derivatives abound in the Quran. Okay. Before we uh, start with that, we also want to locate uh, you. You've just in our break in the discussion mentioned uh, the, the the concept that we've used uh, frequently also last week was about the fitrah, right? And that uh, this human nature, this innate um, sort of uh, propensity disposition that the human being has with deep within him and her is what Allah created every human being on. Right. So Allah explicitly mentions this in the Quran that this is Allah's fitra, <laughs> fitrat Allah illati fataran nasa alayha. It's Allah's natural laws which Allah inhered into the human beings. Right. So the whole notion of the ability to recognize good and evil, good and bad, justice and injustice is all part of that fitra and so too the construct of freedom. The construct of freedom uh, is something which innately human beings recognize as a value that, of course, we that we hold dear and that we aspire and that we want to, in a sense, also protect. And this is a part of this notion. So this fitra is, is part of this universality. The recognition of the fitra is part of the universality. The, the recognition that the deen gives to the fitra is mm. part of the universality of this deen. Right. It gives recognition to the fitra and this fitra absolutely adheres uh, to the, 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 the aspiration of, of freedom. Right. And so that that is one. And so there's a very famous saying by uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, who is obviously this, um, you know, uh, symbol, an iconic symbol of justice. Right. And you would say, do you want to enslave people? وَقَدْ وَلَدَتْهُمْ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ أَحْرَارًا Whilst the mothers have given birth to them as freed beings, gave birth to them in, 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 in freedom, right? And so this notion that the transgression of the freedom and trans, uh, going against uh, the, 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 the freedom and the principles and the dictates of freedom is something which necessarily then leads to all sorts of evil. Mm. All sorts of evil. So I, I want to also before we again start. It, in fact, it, it leads to it leads to massacre. Look at the Palestinian mm. question today. The depri deprivation that is being meted out and and the the, the, the foundations of, of 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 stripping people of the human dignity and the freedom is at the core of this massacre. Is at the core of this genocide. So this is what these things naturally lead. Two, yeah. right? So if you deprive people of their freedom, you deprive people of the humanity, you deprive people of their dignity, it leads to massacre. 
And that's why the Dean of Islam <laughs> mm. <laughs> promotes so and advocates exactly. these values. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, and, 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 and why is it that, uh, you know, to, to quote, uh, I often quote the sort of South African favorite quote when it comes to the Palestinian question that Madiba said that we know very well that our freedom is incomplete mm. without the freedom of the Palestinian people. And so there is no division, there's no div- div- divisibility uh, in these things. It doesn't lend itself to, to division and so forth. But, but let's go quickly to, to the notion of, of, of Huriya or freedom in the Quran. And so there's two ways in which the Quran actually relates to freedom, right? There's two ways and we'll come to that now. So the, the, the core word in the Quran for freedom, as we have said in Arabic today, there's the word Huriya. Right, Hurriya. So the word Hurriya obviously has its root words in the Ha and the Ra and the Ra because the Ra has like a Shadda on it. So Ha, Ra, Ra, right? So whilst the word Hurriya per se does not appear in the Quran, its derivatives appear there at least 13 times in the Holy Quran, right? And um, in different places. And there are six six different um, derivatives that are used in the Quran. So the first one of that is tahrir, which literally means liberation and emancipation, tahrir. Muharrar means the liberated and the emancipated. And then hur is freedom, uh, like as a synonym for hurriya. Hur is freedom. And then also hir is another div- a sort of verge, a sort of inclination or rather declination of the word uh, hur, and 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 hir or har rather har and then harur and harir and so these are also like forms almost of um, 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 amplification. Afrikaans word komt nu bij me in de Khadija. Trappen van vergelijken. So more more free and and. F- yeah. And so Frey, forth. Freier, freister. And so forth, right? So so that's the, the, the forms in which the word appears in the Quran. And there are thirteen different places in the Quran as as it occurs. Oh. So the first of these two f- meanings that they do um, denote is literally emancipation of somebody who's literally enslaved. Mm. And so how many times does Allah not in the Holy Quran speak about any kind of atonement for virtually any conceivable kind of sin that is committed that uh, in and amongst its atonements and forms of kafara is tahriru raqaba mm. to set free a slave uh-huh, uh-huh. and so so that abounds in the, in the quran that abounds in the teachings of our beloved nabi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, the other word in the quran that has the same meaning uh, that as tahrir raqaba, some may recall hearing this term, fakku raqaba. Uh, fakku raqaba literally also means to loosen uh, the tie uh, around the neck of a person. So uh, uh, emancipating that person, uh, setting free uh, that person. So tahrir raqaba, fakku raqaba, etc. So that is the one form of, of freedom. The other form of freedom is a far more uh, a higher level of freedom. That is literal freedom. And this is a higher level of aspiration of freedom, which is, uh, we use the word muharrar here as one of the terms that appear, which is actually in relation to Sayyidina uh, Maryam radiallahu anha, uh, Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam, when she made another to Allah, that if Allah should grant her a, uh, a child, that she would then take, um, take that child. Sorry, this is not Sina Maryam. Sina Maryam's mother, <laughs> the, the wife of uh, Imran. This is about Sina Maryam. And if you grant, if Allah grants her a son, she would make him a, um, a person that is devoted to the service of God, to the mm-hmm. service of Allah. And then she says, "Rabbi inni nazartu, Rabbi inni nazartu laka ma fi batani muharrara." So, O oh Allah, I shall then indeed uh, devote unto you what is in my stomach. Uh, 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 in other words, her child, Muharrara. Muharrara yeah, means devoted entirely to you, um, to God, in, in, in a life of devotion to God. Muharrar. So it's 
the shackles of the world will be removed from that child. The existence will be a pure existence, which is devoted to Allah. This is of the meanings of freedom. (laughs) <laughs> and therefore, when we look at what Imam Fakhru Razi says about uh, freedom, he says that this is a, a, a natural feature of the fitrah. That's the first thing he mentions, a natural feature of the fitrah, this freedom thing, right? And he says, whenever the bodily connection of the soul is weaker than the intellectual connection to the soul, the stronger the freedom of the person. So the bodily connections yeah. to, <laughs> he I says, feel like whenever... We to, I feel like the, we have to pause there for a second. Yeah, okay. can, 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 can Sheikh just repeat that? Three okay. So Imam, Imam uh, Fakhrul Razi says that the, the, this, this thing, the fitrah, is, is of the main features of the fitrah is freedom. Mm-hmm. Right. So he says, therefore, the closer and the, 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 the stronger... Um, the connection is with the, and so he starts with the, the bodily, sort of the physical existence. So he says that whenever the bodily connection of the soul is weaker, the bodily connection, in other words, our worldly needs, our physical needs, whenever the bodily connection to the soul is weaker and the intellectual one is stronger, he says, then the stronger the emancipation and the freedom ah, of that person. I understand a lot of it. So, so that's that's, so that's profound. So one is tied down by what we would call dunya things or the material. Yes. Uh-huh. It's uh-huh. higher it's, order it's, it's a much considerations higher. Yes. that occupies the mind, mm-hmm. not lower order. The superficial things The in superficial life. things. Uh-huh. It's not about the physical things. It's uh-huh. not about the material things. It's about the higher order considerations. And he says the same applies vice versa. So your freedom, you're literally becoming enslaved to material things when that dimension is pronounced yes. and your intellectual sort of is connection to your soul is poor, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, is, is weak. And so you're literally enslaved. <laughs> so so that's that's quite profound. Imam al Ghazali goes further and he says, to enslave intellectual freedom of a person is more dangerous than actual slavery, than literal slavery. So the enslavement of the mind causes the enslavement uh, uh, of the mind and the heart and the person becomes enslaved. Doesn't mean if a person is maybe literally suffer, suffering under the yoke of oppression and enslavement that mm, his mind is mm, enslaved. Mm. <laughs> no, you can't. So that is worse than that, right? And so when we then talk about those two notions, it's about a literal, of course, the dignity of every human being at the basic level to be living free and be responsible for themselves, living in dignity and in freedom. But on the other hand, they are levels of, um, uh, in a sense, your, your, your personal, your intellectual, the, the worth of the individual by himself and in himself, and the relationship, of course, that they have towards themselves and their God and themselves and their creator. So, uh, Sayyidina Maryam's um, dua, Sayyidina Maryam's mother's dua was where she spoke about that emancipated level of, um, uh, of, of livelihood that her child would be devoted to God in that way, in an emancipated way. Right. So that's the two ways in which the Qur'an constructs the notion of, of freedom. And then, of course, the Qur'an more literally goes into the discussions of very emphatically speaking about freedom uh, in the sense that there is no compulsion in the affairs of religion. And this construction here, again, people who are linguists, who like language, they can go to town about the way or the force of the construction of this phrase. And that there is literally, in the Arabic language, nothing more forceful in the way of its construction. So there is no compulsion in the affairs of religion. And what is brilliant here to understand, and we're going to be caught in time, uh, is, the fact, always. Yeah, is the fact that um, the context of the revelation of this verse was brilliant because it had to do with how in the time when the, the women of the Ansar prior to Islam uh, f- had an experience that uh, many of their children die in, 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 this, in infancy. 
And they then would make another, they would make a, 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 a oath to Allah that if um, Allah, you save, if we, and th- what they would do is they would make another to Allah and connecting it, connecting it to letting that child grow up as the only religion that they knew in Medina at the time that was what was pr- prominent was Judaism, that they would let the child grow up in the religion of Judaism. So what happened was, uh, many of the children, of course, then be- became and grew up as Jews because that was the superstition that of these pre-Islamic um, Ansar women had, right, in their in their days of ignorance. And so, when ultimately um, the Jews committed treason in Medina, and they were then expelled out of Medina for their treason, the mothers wanted to force these kids now to become Muslim because they were Jew. And that was the occasion for the revelation. There's no compulsion in the affairs of religion. If you have, and they have grown up as Jews, you don't force them now to become Muslim. How's that? And Khadija, I mean, this is profound. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we hardly ever, we, we may know this verse, many, we, we quote it many times, etc. But, but that's the occasion of its revelation. Mm-hmm. And so Ibn Abbas, um, you know, confirms that notion. And so this principle of, of, of no compulsion in the affairs of faith is such a fundamental one. And it had been clouded at times. And there were occasions when uh, because of historical processes, certain quarters wanted to give the impression as if that fundamental verse of the Quran was abrogated. Yeah. Now, the theory of abrogation in our history, and particularly today, the scholars have written theses about it, is very controversial. And the safest that we can speak about that abrogation is relevant is only that which was indicated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself and not out of the ijtihad of exigencies that people had applied their minds to because then it's tantamount to, uh, an, uh, to eliminating verses of the Quran on the basis of people thinking that this verse contradicts that verse. So it's a very controversial notion. But under the operation of that notion, some quarters have forwarded the, the, the idea that this absolute freedom of faith which Allah establishes, that there's no compulsion in matters of faith was abrogated. And so, of course, that is something that we can talk about still a lot, but but of course it is, it is a, a false notion. And that notion is certainly... Um, untenable in terms of the uh, coherent reading of the Quran. The coherent reading of the Quran in terms of freedom of people's ability to believe as they believe, etc., is something which cannot be um, doubted. Okay, so I think that's the first part of this um, uh, uh, discussion, Khadija, and I see our time is up. That's the first time, uh, the first part of the discussion. We'll have to, for the next time, look into the other three elements. So we're going to look at, after we've looked at freedom of, 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 of uh, rela- rather freedom of um, belief. belief, we're yeah. looking uh, after that at human, human dignity, dignity, inshallah. Yeah. So we'll start there, inshallah, next week. But um, the notion then of, um, the establishment it must be. and so yes it, many people I don't know yourself too may have heard about this notion you know that somehow there is a doubt or some kind of uncertainty about this foundational value which accords and aligns with the fitra of human beings and which really aligns with the higher purposes of the sharia the maqasid sharia mm-hmm. and that is why this kind of thinking is gaining momentum in our contemporary setting which was not the case uh, before and that is to evaluate things from this framework of what the higher purposes and the objectives of the Sharia represent. And certainly this um, principle of the freedom of belief and freedom specifically uh, is elevated by our scholars since the time of um, Ibn Ashur um, and, and, and everybody who came after him who spoke about the higher purposes of the Sharia would include the principle of freedom freedom al-hurriya 
As always, shukran so much. Lots and lots for us to ponder about and to think about until we continue with this uh, with this uh, series and next week. Uh, Sheikh Hassan Talib, shukran so much. Have yourself a beautiful Wednesday, inshallah. Shukran so very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.